The Boxcar Children, The Mystery on the Ice by Gertrude Chandler Warner. Chapter 1. Exciting news. Hurry, Benny, Jessie called from downstairs. I'm hurrying, six-year-old Benny answered, impatiently slicking down his hair. He wanted to look his best tonight, for Joe and Alice Alden, their cousins, who had invited all the Aldens for a surprise celebration. What were they celebrating? He was glad Joe and Alice had moved from Pine Grove to Greenfield. He liked them a lot. Violet poked her head in. Are you ready, she paused. You look handsome, Benny. Benny grinned at her as he followed her down the steps. You look handsome too, Violet. Jessie waited at the bottom of the stairs said, yes, Violet does look very pretty. Ten-year-old Violet in her lavender sweater and jeans bean. Jessie, who was 12, wore a white cotton shirt and a chocolate brown sweater, which matched her long hair and brown pants. Watch their dog sat by the door. Bark, he barked, hoping to go along. Not tonight, Watch, Violet said, patting his head. Struggling into her ski jacket, Jessie said, Grandfather's warming up the station wagon. Where's Henry? Benny asked, looking around. In the car with Grandfather, Jessie replied, pulling the hood of her jacket over her head. Benny put down on his down jacket and pulled on his mittens. I want to see what Joe and Alice are celebrating, don't you? Yes, Violet said. It sounds like a surprise, and I like surprises. Jessie laughed, opening the door. So do I. It was odd that Grandfather didn't act as if he was going to be surprised. Every time they mentioned the dinner at Joe and Alice's, he just gave a knowing little smile. She was certain he knew what was going on. Benny ran down the walk, which was heaped with snow on either side. He'd helped Henry shovel this morning. He jumped into the back seat. We're all together and we're off to a celebration, he shouted, sitting next to Jessie. Grandfather glanced back at his grandson. That's right, Benny, he smiled, pleased that his grandchildren always got along with one another so well. The car wheels crunched over the packed snow on the short drive through town. Benny watched wide-eyed as they passed sparkling windows filled with toys. In the town square, a huge Christmas tree towered gleaming with red and green lights. Next to the tree stood a giant memorial. Its candles cast light over the glistening snow. When they reached the edge of Greenfield where Joe and Alice lived, fluffy snowflakes had started to drift onto the ground. Good weather for ice skating, Jessie said. Bad weather for hockey, Henry teased, his eyes sparkling. He knew, though, that Jessie was the best and the most graceful skater of them all. Here we are, children. Grandfather said, parking before an old grey shingled three-storey house. Tiny white lights twinkled on a pine tree on a spacious lawn. Doesn't the house look beautiful, Violet said. It's very different from the way it was when Joe and Alice first bought it. She giggled, remembering Joe's foot breaking through the porch step. Henry got out, opened the back car door for Benny and the girls. We did a lot of work on the old rough house before Joe and Alice moved in, he said. We sure did. And remember, we thought the house was haunted, Benny said, running alongside Henry on the way to the front door. Lifting the eagle door knocker, which was framed by a large evergreen wreath, Benny waited. He stomped first one booted foot, foot then another. You children have cleaned many places, Grandfather said. The deserted library and the old motel, Violet added. But each place was different. It's fun to see the before and after. Don't forget we stayed by ourselves in the boxcar, Henry said. Remember we ran away so we wouldn't have to live with a grandfather we'd never known? He paused, smiling. We didn't realise how lucky we were when Grandfather found us. That's right, Benny said emphatically. Just then, Alice flung wide the front door. I thought I heard voices. Come in, Joe said. Let me take your coats. 
How wonderful everything is, Jessie exclaimed, admiring the many candles and the lovely red carpet. Two crimson wingback chairs nestled before the fireplace. Violet walked over to the fire to warm her hands. She gazed above the mantel at the portrait of a young girl. This was the girl who had once lived here and had run away to marry against her father's wishes. I see you've hung a seal of Roth's painting. Yes, Joe said, standing beside her. She's part of the house. We've become good friends with Celia, you know, and even though she's old and doesn't get around very well, she visits us every so often. Alice joined then, and Joe slipped his arm around her waist. I'm glad we brought this house. At first I was afraid it might need too much work. You've changed it into a, a charming home, Grandfather said. Benny sniffed. I smell something good, he hinted. Alice leaned down. You're not hungry, are you, Benny? He peered up at her. A little, he admitted. Joe laughed. Maybe roast beef and mashed potatoes will satisfy your appetite? Benny looked up and nodded vigorously. Soon everyone was seated around the dining room table. Benny piled his plate with broccoli, beef and potatoes and then helped himself to a hot biscuit. This salad is delicious, Violet said shyly. Thanks, Violet, Alice said, setting cranberry sauce by Benny's elbow. Once cake and ice cream were served, Joe cleared his throat. I've invited everyone here to share our good news, he gazed with affection at Alice. What is it? Benny leaned forward, his eyes big. Something wonderful, Joe said. Your grandfather and his lawyer have worked with Alice and me to bring us a child from Korea. Yes, we are flying to Seoul in two days to pick up a little Korean girl we are going to adopt, Alice said, her pretty face glowing. Her name is Su Lee and she is seven years old, Joe said, and a broad smile lightening, lightening his face too. A little girl, exclaimed Jessie. Questions flew back and forth. All evening they discussed Joe and Alice's adopted daughter. How would she like American food? How would she be, be dressed? Would she understand English? English? Would she make friends at school? When it was time to leave, Joe and Alice kissed their cousins. Joe shook grandfather's hand. Thanks for all your help, Uncle James. I see you can keep a secret. I've never seen such surprised faces. Standing in the doorway, Alice waved. We'll see you on our return. Once in the car, Benny asked, What does adopted mean? Adopted means to take someone into your home, Henry explained. Someone to be your very own, because the child's parents can't take care of her or him. And grab Grandfather continued, papers will be signed showing that Joe and Alice are the child's legal parents. Benny's round face wore a puzzled frown. What does legal mean? He questions, cocking his head. Legal means that by law, Joe and Alice will be recognised at Sue Lee's mother and father, Jessie said. Oh, Benny said, sinking back into the seat. I guess I understand. That night, Jessie pulled up her comforter and stared out the window. She tried to imagine what the Korean child would be like. She was so sure Su, Su Lee would be happy to be welcomed into such a warm and loving home. She wondered where Korea was exactly. She knew the country was near China, but she wanted to know more about it. Tomorrow they must go to the library and find all the information they could on Korea. But the next morning, Grandfather had even more news. The news so exciting that Jessie changed her mind about going to the library. Chapter 2. The Murray's Party When the children came down for breakfast, Grandfather glanced up from his newspaper. Mrs McGregor set four places for you and left the oatmeal on the stove, he said, finishing his coffee. She, want, she went to spend the holidays with her sister in Oregon. Violet slipped her orange juice. 
We don't need a housekeeper, she said. We'll cook for you, Grandfather. James Alden chuckled. I'm afraid you'll be on your own most of the time. For the next week, I'll be attending meetings of the hospital directors. Then he added with a twinkle in his eye, Do you think you can manage? Oh, I think so, Henry said, rising and filling each bowl with oatmeal and raisins. Yes, we've been on our own thousands of times, Benny said. Henry laughed. Not quite that many, but we can cook, clean house, shop and run errands, he said with pride in his voice. Good, Grandfather said, pushing back his chair and standing. Then I'm off to a committee meeting. I know I needn't worry about you. He paused, a smile spreading across his face. I almost forgot. He pulled an envelope from his pocket. You know, he continued, that I'm on the board of directors of Greenfield Hospital. Well, a skating troupe is coming to town to do a holiday benefit performance for the hospital. A skating troupe coming here, Jessie exclaimed. If there was anything she loved, it was ice skating. She enjoyed gliding across the ice and she loved watching excellent skaters. Oh boy, Benny clapped his hands. May we go and see the ice skaters? Grandfather laughed. Better than that, Benny, he handed the envelope to Violet. Violet opened the flap and pulled out a heavy card with gold printing. Read it, Henry urged. Clearing her throat, Violet read, To James Alden and guests, you are invited to a party for the Starlight Skating Troupe, Thursday, December 27, 7.30. William and Sarah Murray, 222 White Oak Lane. Jessie sank back in her chair. The Starlight Troupe, one of the best skating shows in the country. Between mouthfuls of toast, Benny said, I like ice skaters too, his eyes shone. Grandfather nodded, happy to see their reaction. I know you'll enjoy them. Not only that, but the skaters will be practising all week at the Civic Centre. You can watch them whenever you want. Jessie gasped with pleasure. I can't believe it, she said. Are the skaters in town now, Henry inquired. They arrived this afternoon, James Alden asked. We'll meet them tonight at the Murray's. You remember my good friends, William and Sarah? They'll be delighted to see you again. You mean we're invited too, Violet asked in a soft voice. Grandpa smiled. I wouldn't go without you. You all are the guests in the invitation. I suppose I have to get dressed up, Benny wrinkled his nose. Don't I? James Alden nodded. It's a special party. You want to look your best when you meet the ice skaters, don't you, Benny? Sure, his round face brightened. Maybe they'll teach me how to skate backwards. I think, Henry said, that first you should learn to skate forward. I know how to skate forward, Benny protested in a loud voice. Yes, you do, Benny, Violet said, smiling. But don't you think you could be a little more steadier on your feet? Benny glanced at Violet, reluctantly agreeing, I guess so. I want to skate without falling down so many times. That afternoon, the children went to the grocery store. Then Henry read a mystery. Benny and Violet worked on a jigsaw puzzle and Jessie wrote a letter to Aunt Jane. In the late afternoon, they made a light supper of toasted ham and cheese sandwiches and milk. They knew more food would be, in, be served at the party. At seven o'clock, Jessie was the first one ready, so she sat by the fireplace waiting for the others. She read and, pa and petted Watch, who snuggled next to her on the love seat. She was looking especially pretty tonight, wearing a hair clip that had been a gift from Grandfather. She wore a blouse and a skirt. Soon Violet, in a green velvet dress, joined Jessie. What? No lavender? Jessie teased. Not tonight, Violet said, sitting on a footstool before the fire. This is my holiday dress. Henry appeared the most grown up in his grey blazer and navy trousers. Benny rushed in. I'm ready. His hair was neatly combed and he was wearing a navy jacket and grey pants. Grandfather was 
elegant in his tuxedo and bow tie. He held out two elbows to escort Jessie and Violet to the car. When they arrived at the arched doorway of the Murray's mansion, a woman in black with a white apron and cap opened the door and took their coats. Violet gasped at the large oak panel hall, the glittering crystal chandeliers and the flames dancing in the marble fireplace. Benny admired the toy soldiers lined up on the mantelpiece. A tall woman with white hair piled on top of her head held out her, hand, her arms and came towards them. James, how nice to see you. She blushed. She brushed Grandfather's cheek with a quick kiss. Then she smiled at the younger Aldens. I haven't seen your grandfather. I haven't seen your grandchildren for some time. Let's see," she said, tapping her ringed finger on her chin. "This is Jessie and Violet, and oh my!" She paused to gaze at Henry. "How tall you've grown, Henry!" And this is is Benny. Benny piped up. "Of course, Benny," Sarah said. Wide-eyed Benny stared at Sarah. You shine more than all the holiday lights put together, he marbled. I guess I do, Mrs. Murray said with a laugh, touching her diamond necklace, her dangling diamond earrings, diamond ring, a ruby bracelet shimmering in the light. William Murray hurried to greet them. The Aldens, I've been waiting for you. I want you to meet our honoured guests, the ice skaters. William Murray and James Alden were the same age, but there, but there the resemblance ended. James was tall, William was short and chubby. William patted Benny on the back. Make yourself at home, young man. I will, Benny promised. After welcoming the, ch the other children, William left with James for a discussion in the study. Jessie craned her neck, attempting to spot the ice skaters. In the corner of the room, a small blonde woman chatted with an attractive young man. Apparently, they were members of the troupe. But before Jessie introduced herself, a plump woman in sh with short black hair bustled up to Sarah Murray. Have you seen Ollie Olsen? she asked. I can't keep track of him. The last I saw of Ollie the Clown, Mrs Murray said, he was filling his plate at the buffet table. Ah, the frowning woman exclaimed, I knew it. He's breaking training again. Mrs. Murray introduced each Alden. Children, meet Janet O'Shea, the owner of the Starlight Troop. Janet, however, scarcely noticed the children. I must find Ollie, she said, pressing her lips firmly together. I'm sending him back to the hotel. She strode off, leaving the Aldens to stare after her. A short time later, she passed by with a skinny man who towered over her. They walked swiftly through the room. Janet was saying, Go back to the hotel and don't order room service. I can't afford it. That must be Ollie with Mrs O'Shea, Jenny, Jessie thought. The clown skater gave Janet a mock bow and was gone before they could meet him. Ollie's impossible, Janet muttered. What a rude woman, Jessie thought. If the other skaters were like her, she didn't care whether she met them or not. Chapter 3. Unwelcome News When Sarah Murray asked the Aldens if they'd like to meet a pair of skaters, Jessie forgot about the unfriendly owner of the troop. Mrs Murray steered Jessie, her brothers and sister, through the crowd, crowd and over to the same blonde woman and young man Jessie had seen earlier. This is Alexandra Patterson and Carl Underhill. Carl used to play hockey. Alexandra turned, pleased to meet the Aldrins. Carl, just as friendly as Alexandra, shook hands with each of them. From the way Carl gazed at Alexandra and the way Alexandra's eyes lit up when she looked at Carl, Violet thought the two were in love. You're lucky to live in Greenfield, Alexandra said, holding a pink rose, a shade darker than her chiffon dress. From what I've seen, it's a lovely town. Jessie kept staring at Alexandra. Finally, she said, We like it here. Where are you from, Alexandra? I'm from Chicago, the Windy City, and please call me Alex. The dainty girl's laugh tinkled lightly on the air. All at once, she dropped her rose. Carl stooped to, re to retrieve it, 
but Henry had already scooped it up and returned it to her. Why, thank you, Henry, Alex said, her green eyes sparkling with pleasure. Amazed, Benny watched as a flush of crimson crept over Henry's face. Ever played hockey? Carl asked. Uh, what? Henry stammered, still grazing, glazing at, gazing at Alex. Ever play hockey? Carl repeated. At last, Henry turned to Carl. Yes, I like hockey. Good. Is there a place we can play outdoors? Down at Burton's Park, Benny said. The city floods it in the winter. All the kids skate there. Sounds good, Carl said. How about a game? You name the time and place, Henry said. I know you need to practice. Oh, yeah, Carl glanced at Janet O'Shea. Boss lady is cracking the whip. The company could go under if our show doesn't earn more money. He paused and then grinned. But we'll play on Tuesday. How about it? A game with you would be great, Henry responded. I'm sure we can. you can teach me the finer points of hockey. Me too, Benny rubbed his chin. First, though, I'm too wobbly. I need to learn how to stand up long enough to hit the puck. Carl laughed. We'll work on that, Benny. He thought a second. What time on Tuesday? Two o'clock, OK? Henry said. You've got it, Carl said. Hi! A young girl on crutches hobbled up to them. Her red curls bobbed. I'm Marcia Westley, Westerly, she said, holding out her hand. I overheard your names, she smiled. I'm new to the company. Were you in a, in a skating troupe before? Violet asked. Yes, the moonbeams, but I'm sure you've never heard of us. You see, I'm from Winnipeg, Canada. Jessie knew almost all the famous skating groups, but she'd never heard of the moonbeams. I haven't had a chance to skate with Carl and Alex, Marcia said, holding up the, a crutch. I'd better start soon, though, or I'll be too rusty to skate. Violet smiled. I think it's like riding a bicycle. Once you know how, you can pick it up no matter how long it's been. Marcia winced as she shifted a foot. Did you fall on the ice? Benny questioned, looking at her bandaged ankle. Yes, I tried a triple jump and landed in a heap. She shook her head, apparently reliving her awful fall. She looked sad, but then a maid offered a tray full of tiny tuna sandwiches. Marcia broke into a smile. I'm starved, she said. The maid announced the buffet table is ready. Let's go, Benny said, heading for the dining room. Henry laughed. One mention of food and Benny is off and running. But when the others caught up with Benny, they were overwhelmed by the lavish display of smoked salmon, baked ham and roast turkey. Cranberry and nut bread, hot biscuits and relishes were at one end of the long table and pasta and vegetables at the other. A chef wearing a tall white hat stood behind the table. What would you like, he asked. Benny pointed to the turkey. The chef carved a slice of turkey and placed it on Benny's plate. And could I have a little ham, please? Benny asked. You may have as much as you like, the chef said cutting a generous piece of ham. Benny waited as the chef, chef drizzled pine apple juice over his ham. Then in a bolder voice he said, And some salmon? The chief gave a hearty laugh. I'd like to see a good I like to see a good appetite. Henry, Violet and Jessie followed Benny. Their heaping plates were just as full as Benny's. They sat down at a small table and began to eat. Did you see the desserts? Jessie said. Benny glanced up. Where? Right behind you, Violet said smilingly. I hope you saved room. Benny whirled around. He loved desserts. His eyes grew big. A chocolate cake decorated with strawberries was surrounded by several pies and many kinds of holiday cookies. Oh boy, Benny said. I'm having a gingerbread boy and a reindeer and some cake. They all laughed. The party had been lots of fun and on the way home the children scarcely noticed that it had begun to snow heavily. All they could talk about was the wonderful food and the beautiful mansion and the ice skaters. 
That night after Violet had gone to bed, she lay awake, thinking about the grand party. In the morning, the surprised children awoke to mounds of flying snow and howling wind. Mr. Alden greeted his grandchildren at breakfast. Today I'll be working in my office. I have a number of calls to make. You're not going out, Benny asked. Not today. Because of a blizzard, most roads are blocked and highways closed. A blizzard, Henry said, looking out the window at the sea of white. Yes, Mr. Alden said, I'm afraid it's bad out. He hesitated, and I have more bad news. Jessie looked at Grandfather expectantly. What's the bad news? asked Benny. I just got a call from William. The Murrays were burglarised last night. After everyone left the party and the Murrays went to bed, someone broke in and stole Sarah's jewellery. She discovered the theft this morning. Oh no, Violet dropped into the chair. Not Mrs Murray's beautiful jewels. Grandfather nodded. All her diamonds and a ruby bra bracelet were stolen. She had left them in her dressing room. She said she had forgotten to lock the drawer to it. She kept them in. Of course, the Murrays called the police. Grandfather slipped on his sweater. I'll be working late, but if you need me, don't be afraid to interrupt me. He turned and went back upstairs saying, Take care, children. Let's be sure our doors are locked. Benny checked the front and back doors. Now no one can get in here. After Grandfather left, the children sat silently at the breakfast table. At last, Jessie said, Who would rob the Murrays? I don't know, Henry said. It's hard to understand, he bit his lip, remembering Grandfather's warning about locking their own doors. Did a thief actually skulk about in quiet Greenfield? Let's see if we can hear the weather forecast, Violet said, jumping up to turn the dial on the kitchen radio. An announcer was saying, all highways going in and out of Greenfield are impassable. The airport is closed until further notice. Do not travel today unless it's an emergency. The storm is expected to last another three to four hours. Will we be all right? Benny asked in a worried voice. Jessie smiled. We'll be warm and cosy. The storm won't last forever. She glanced outside at the weather. At least the robber couldn't escape from Greenfield, but who could it be? She hoped it wasn't one of the ice skaters. Could it have been one of the guests?